welcome to Essential Ingredients, powered by Next Gen Purpose. EI serves up thoughtful conversations with industry leaders and pioneers who support a regenerative future for our food system. The stories shared by our guests are meant to spark curiosity and inspire informed global change. Good afternoon, welcome to Essential Ingredients. I'm Justine Reichman, your host. Today with me is Petra Higby. She is the co-founder with her sister of Caviar Co. Welcome, Petra. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased and I'm so pleased that I hopefully correctly introduced you. Absolutely. It was perfect. It was oh perfect. God. That was very <laughs> stressful. My hands got a little sweaty. I'm sorry to put that on <laughs> you last minute. No worries. No worries. I just, I, I aim for perfection or I strive for perfection. I it's very stressful. I can understand it. It's a hard, yeah, that's a big goal to, to reach. No, I, I completely understand. <laughs> Well, it's great to meet you. It's great to chat with you. And I'm so excited to learn a little bit about, you know, Caviar Co. and you. Um, I, I know I'm a fan, but for those that are not familiar with Caviar Co., it is a caviar company and they have a lovely location here in Tiburon, which is the one I went to. But I'll let Petra introduce the company and tell you a little bit about it because it's a special company and they're mission driven. And I'm excited to hear directly from you a little bit more about it. Yeah, well, again, thank you so much for, for having me and your interest in what we're doing. And um, thank you for coming to see us, you know, having come to us twice, we really appreciate it and hope that you've had really great experiences and, and continue to do so. So um, I started the caviar company with my sister back in 2015. And we started actually like out of our apartments in San Francisco. We we lived together, we moved here together from Texas and um, my sister is a CPA. So she, we say she's the, the kind of the brains behind most things Caviar Co related and, and really helped get the company set up. And then I did the marketing and sales. And so when we, but I came from, um, I've worked for a caviar like, um, direct to consumers. I've, I, I had experience with wholesale, mainly marketing, and I worked for Caviar Farm prior to starting the company with my sister. So um, I really... Caviar. You are not new to caviar. <laughs> no, I'm not. And, and so many people ask me, like, how did you get into caviar? And I still don't have like a quick answer because I feel like it just was not something I did not grow up eating caviar. I'm from West Texas, you know, so we're kind of... I where in West Texas from, where are you from? Um, I, Texas is a big state. <laughs> it is. I'm from Lubbock. So where Texas Tech University is. Okay. So, but I kind of grew up as a steak and chicken kind of girl. And, um, you know, and then I moved out to California and my mind was completely opened when I would go to the farmer's market and see this like beautiful, bright colored produce, these tomatoes that I've never seen so red before. Or, um, you know, I started eating like salad and trying different things and understanding how chefs work and how each ingredient really plays a role um, in a dish and really started appreciating chefs and admiring what they do. And is I just knew it was something I wanted to be a part of. Like the hospitality industry is so cool. And you know, if you think about chefs, like they work so hard to develop a dish, um, from the the R and D, sourcing the ingredients, the execution, you know, putting it all together. And then you think about how long it takes for us, to, like consumers, to eat a dish, right? It's it's like that, you know. Uh -huh. Where where it's wait it's in and it's out. Yeah, exactly. And so it, I really feel like chefs are they really are um, very selfless individuals, and like they they do come from a place of nourishment. They want to take care of people. They want um, they create these restaurants and these places for people to come in, whether they're celebrating special occasions, whether they're mourning. You know, they just they're or they're just they're just coming in for a great dinner you know like they're having want to want to have a great night they kind of cater to everyone and and um so i i had to be a part of it so when was the first time you tried caviar i the first time i tried caviar when i was working for a caviar company actually you had never tried caviar before 
you work for the caviar company. So you got this, or not the caviar company, but the first time when you got that job, your first job for a caviar company. Yeah, yeah, it was my first time to ever, ever try it. And um, because again, I was, I, I was relatively like small-minded, I think, whenever it came to food until I moved out to California. My first job out here was working for a caviar company. I just needed somewhere. So how'd you get a job working for a caviar company knowing nothing about caviar? Yeah. <laughs> Such a good, I mean, I, well, I can't be all, I'm not trying to be, you know, I am being blunt, but seriously, no, how no. do you tell yourself to get a job? I guess the next down? step in the timeline there is before, when I graduated, I, I, I grew up in Lubbock and then I went to Texas Tech in Lubbock. So by my, the end of my senior year, by graduation, I was like, ready to to move and get out of town and uh, finally brave enough to leave because I've always been kind of a homebody and um, which is funny because now I've been in California for 10 years but um, I moved out to Carmel because my aunt was in Carmel and she's like hey just come out here come check it out with me hang out with me let me see what we can do like get let's get you an internship something fun I'll reach out to all of my network of friends and see if anyone has anything for you and she helped me get a internship with Coastal Luxury Management and they are the company that they put on LA Food and Wine Pebble Beach Food and Wine um, and that's where I got this exposure to all of these chefs. That's where like my whole mind and eyes and heart were opened to hospitality. So I missed a step there in, in the transition from loving okay. Texas so to California. Got it. So now we connected the dots. Now we know how you got into food, but there's something special about Caviar Co and how you source your product that makes you different from the rest. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we just, we really care about, um, like we, we try to work with farms that only have brood stock for their own brood stock. For example, the farm that I came from that I used to work for. Wait, before you get into that, can you tell us, for those listeners or viewers that are watching that don't know what brood stock is, can you let us know what is brood stock? Yeah, of course. So that means that they have their own like females within the farm that they know that they have raised, that they they're under their supervision the whole time and that they they have raised. They they take the um, eggs from them every year through C-section, actually. And that's how they create new eggs and new stock to be then harvested, you know, down the line for either meat or for caviar. But um, everything's been done under the same farm because there are a lot of caviar farms all around us, actually, all around Sacramento. It's really fascinating because there's a specific species of sturgeon that is native to our backyard, to the bay. Um, it's the white sturgeon. And so there are a lot of white sturgeon farms all around California or mainly Sacramento. Um, but what a lot of people do is they'll either buy the fish, mature fish from fish farmers or something like that. But we want to work with like specifically with Sterling Caviar, they have their own like, so they have their own brew stock. So they have these females that every year they take for the spawning and they fertilize the eggs with sperm from the males in the farm. And I've gotten to be a part of the spawning and the processing and things like that at this farm. But um, that way it's all been under the same umbrella, right? Like they know exactly where these eggs are coming from what their lineage is and what the diets have been from the, the you know, from different um, uh, generations, you know, in the past. And so the flip side of that is, what does the flip side of that look like when people don't do it this way? So a lot of people will take it, like take, um, will purchase mature females from, from caviar farms and then they process the caviar themselves where, um, so there are some, some producers and purveyors who are known just to buy fish, but they haven't been responsible for the upbringing. They, they haven't been a part of like, they don't, of the diet of the, the waters and of the whole story of the fish. And I think it's a lot harder to know exactly what you're getting whenever that's the case. And so the impact then is on the quality of what you're eating, the, right? Right, right. Because you can't, it's like, just, it's almost like taking a shortcut, you know, it's like, 
Um, you want to be able to, I, I think it's important to see the sturgeon through from start to finish from when they're hatched when they're they're raised throughout their whole life and then whenever they're processed for caviar i think it's a whole story right you can't just read one chapter out of a book you read the book from start to finish right and so how did you get why was this so important to you out of all the things in the world you got you got involved in caviar and its story and making sure that people got the best possible caviar you know making sure that it was fed properly, that it had the right lifespan, you know, how, do, how come that's important to you and making sure that your customers receive the best possible caviar? I think part of it is that I, I really do love a challenge. And that's one of the challenges with caviar is, you know, getting that message from the very beginning to the end to the consumer when they're enjoying it on their plate is there's so much that happens in between and so much, um, that consumers don't know about, and even from mislabeling to how the ca caviar was handled to where the caviar actually came from. You know, before we started recording, you were talking about Ocetra, that you've always loved Ocetra. And, you know, what's really funny is that Ocetra is one of the most coveted um, species and types of caviar, and people know that now. So these purveyors know that you'll see that word really overused. For example, um, if you look on a label and you see Siberian Ocetra, there's actually no such thing. It's either a Siberian sturgeon or it's an Ocetra sturgeon. And they're, it's like calling, I, I say it's like calling a Labrador a boxer, right? You have your Labrador and you have your boxer, but you don't have a Labrador boxer. And, um, but because people know about Ocetra and it being one of the kind of original Caspian caviars, they, they just tack the word on and there are no repercussions really for doing that. And so that's why we get really excited to what we do because like we focus, you know, of course we want caviar to be approachable, but that's what every every caviar company these days says we're like making caviar more approachable more of an everyday indulgence. And that's great. Like we're totally on board with that. We want to do that too because it's, it is something that can be, you know, more in the wine category to where like you just open up a bottle of wine, you know, and it's, it's the same thing if a, cav a jar of caviar can actually go just as far as a bottle of wine and cost you just the same, but how are you supposed to know what to open unless you're educated on it? And that's where like, you know, a lot more people are educated on wine than they are in caviar. They can talk about, oh, well, I prefer Pinot Noir to, to Cabernet. Okay, so like, well, how can we get people to say, oh, I actually prefer Hackleback to white sturgeon because we need to educate them on it. So that way they know what their preferences are and what the characteristics are to look for whenever they're buying. And then, but not only for their preference, but also for holding caviar companies accountable to, to be able to open up a jar of caviar and be like, these eggs are really, really small and they're really dark. There's no way that this is a white sturgeon or there's no way that this is Kaluga hybrid. There's something fishy going on around here without no, <laughs> no pun, pun intended. <laughs> yeah, so, so what's the easiest way for a beginner that wants to learn about caviar? to understand uh, or take their first steps or entree into starting to understand the differences in caviar. So I think you always, to, for me, what one thing that I also love about our company is that we do these flights, right? Like we do, whether it's in a gift set online that we're shipping across the country, or we do virtual caviar classes that we started doing during COVID and we've continued to do because you kind of have to have a point of reference, right? Because when my sister and I first started our company, of course, it was all we were talking about, like, oh, we're starting a caviar company and uh, the common you know everyone say I love caviar and we're these caviar nerds that you were like oh what's your favorite you know like let's talk about it what where are you getting your caviar from what what states are coming from what country you, bring? you know whatever and they're like I just like caviar you know <laughs> was the answer like I don't know caviar. <laughs> and that's where we really saw us, my sister and I were like you know there's a, a huge void here that people need to realize 
again, that's just being like, I love wine. Well, what's your favorite? What, what kind of wine do you want to drink tonight? And like, I don't know wine. That's the exact same thing at like in our minds, the same conversation. And so, so, but in order to learn about wine too, or, or anything else, you need a reference point, right? So if you can get a flight together and try two to three, to get started, do two to three different types of caviar. Um, like you've seen in our tasting room, we have these caviar flights where it's like three different. I did that actually. Yeah, and, and hopefully you were able to be like, you know what, this second one is my favorite, or I like them all for different reasons, you know, but you could, hopefully they were all distinctively different enough for you to, to see what, are the, what the characteristics were. Some of the eggs were smaller, some of the eggs might have been darker or lighter or more decadent and more rich and have more texture, but... Or briny, it, saltier, uh, creamier, all different things. I mean, there was a variety of things. Yeah, exactly. And so that's where whenever people are really wanting to learn about caviar, I do recommend getting, you know, starting with two to three, you don't have like, we have 12 different products, you don't have to get all 12 products, but to know, get, get start with two to three, and then you can cross compare and be like, oh, this hackleback is actually more briny than I like, but the white sturgeon that I'm having right next to it is really creamy and buttery. So right now, I'm going to stick with the creamy and buttery one and, and say this white sturgeon is my favorite. And then down the line, try a white sturgeon next to a Kaluga hybrid or Russian Ocetra. And then you can be like, understand. You're making me, you're making my mouth water. <laughs> Good. Good. That's what I'm going to tasting while we were on this podcast. I know. Hindsight is. I know. I mean, we're going to have to have a follow-up and do like a little virtual tasting. Sure. And like I said, you know, I'm, I'm having a baby next week. So then the next time we can have champagne and oh, <laughs> brilliant. I definitely, I'm in for that. I'm in for that. I think that that would be great. So I'm curious, we have get a lot of founders on here. We get a lot of people that are starting businesses and you started this, what'd you say about seven years ago? Yes. In 2015. And before that you had worked in the business, but it didn't sound like you were an entrepreneur before. Is this your is this your first shot at being an entrepreneur? Yes, it is. But I just um, I had I just graduated from college in 2012. So, okay, so as an entrepreneur, as a first time entrepreneur, with, you're having great success. You have what two places now: San Francisco and Marin. Yes, you're with your sister. What would you tell other entrepreneurs? Um, you know, given your success, lack of experience as an entrepreneur, but experience in the business, would you, what, what, what advice might you give them? Yeah. You know, I think, um, the most important thing that I still have to tell myself on a daily basis, because obviously I do get overwhelmed and I do, I, I would be lying if I said I didn't have self-doubt too. You know, I come from, um, I am not a business background. I went to school for speech language and hearing sciences. So I thought I was going to either be like helping with speech impediments or selling hearing aids, you know, I was going to guess audiology. <laughs> Yeah, I love audit. And it's, it was fascinating to me. I, I loved it, but you know, my path went elsewhere. And so I, I do have self-doubt sometimes of like, do I know what I'm doing? And, and what I've learned is I just try to put one foot in front of the other. And I just got to keep that forward momentum and like surround myself with good people. I have, um, like you, you know, you were just saying you met Sarah. I have, I have such a great team. I have, um, a really, really good team in San Francisco and a really good team behind me in Tiburon. And, and I know wholeheartedly that none of this would happen without their support and their trust and, um, and building me up and working together. Like I think the people that you surround yourself with and how you treat them is one of the most important things because it's so common especially for, for young people um, coming out of college, they don't really understand exactly how they should be treated. They don't know what's right and wrong. And, and you know, as a, as a business owner, I feel like I want them to know what it, what, how they're supposed to be treated and, and have raised that bar high because again, I wouldn't be able to do any of this without them is kind of how I feel. And, and it's not even about money either, because when Saskia and I started our business, we started with, we've bootstrapped this whole way. We have no investors, we have no loans, we have 
you know, we, we started with our savings and, and it made us make really hard decisions getting started. We, you know, we didn't have any employees when we got started, but it made us really dive into just even getting labels printed. You know, I had to really research, like we have, so we have 12 different products, six different sizes. How are we not going to blow our whole budget? Our <laughs> you gotta you know, be scrappy. It's all about being scrappy and thoughtful and figuring out, you know, making the right choices and taking a little bit of a leap of faith too. Oh yeah. Huge, huge leap of faith. And, and the nice thing is, is I, I feel fortunate enough to, to where I, I felt like, you know, if this doesn't work out, I will just, I'll, I'll go work for someone else or I'll go get another job or like that. There are so many great jobs and opportunities out there. Of course, like the dream is to work for myself is to have my business, but I know that if I'm willing to work for it, I can, I can, keep working right it's not like i if i lose my business it, it's obviously devastating and and would be terrible <laughs> but i will just keep working you know I, I will just get a job wherever i can get a job and and know that i will do what i have to do to survive and i think that's part of the entrepreneurial spirit though entrepreneurs feel like they will do whatever they need to do to survive and that's a leadership skill that's an entrepreneurial skill and I don't think that everyone has that drive in them. And that's okay. I'm not, no, not everybody needs to have that drive, but that really is a drive I see within entrepreneurs because you can't be an entrepreneur if you're not willing to put it all on the line. You're not willing to do it yourself. You're not willing to fix it and make it happen and figure it out and surround yourself with the people that can help you do it and roll up your sleeves and just work really hard. Yeah. Yeah. The, if, your, if your team doesn't see you working really hard, it's not going to motivate them to work really hard. Right. I wholeheartedly agree with you. So what's new and what's next for Caviar uh, Co? You know, we are just really, we're just so excited that events are picking back up and we're getting involved. We just did, um, like in November, we got to do Paris Hilton's wedding, which was so exciting. Wow. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of really great events and and kind of parties in line for for this year. Um, like I mentioned, I am I'm just having a little a baby next week, <laughs> and so we're getting through that. He'll probably be in the office for you know the first year or so and being passed around um, <laughs> around this office. But we definitely always are looking for what the next steps are and what the next growth period is. But um, at least for for right now, we're going to work on perfecting our events, new event activations, and um, spreading our wings in that way, which is really exciting. Again, coming out of COVID, it makes it feel like we really are coming out and seeing more people and and we love events because it's how we get to talk to people right this is how we get to show people the two different variations of caviar and usually when we do events we do these like caviar bars where we have two to three different types of caviar okay, side by gotta, side i mean i gotta tell you i really need a caviar bar right now i'm like trying <laughs> for caviar i mean it's wetting my appetite. I need like a whole sampling with like a little rosé or champagne. Well, we can like do a little bit of a tea. Pardon? We can do a champagne flight with it. Do a champagne I'm flight. I feel like there's a little bit of a tease this whole time. <laughs> I keep feeling like somebody's going to end up at my door. In this whole conversation, somebody could have gotten from Tiburon to Larkspur during this call. During I this know. call. We should have acted. We did not plan properly. I know. <laughs> I'm just kidding with you. But, but we next will, time we're going to have to do that together. Uh, that would I would love that. That would be really fun. You know. So I'm so glad that we got to chat. I'm so glad that I got to learn a little bit about your story. I'd love to meet your sister, and you know, continue to follow along with what you guys do, and and maybe even participate in some of these activations because I'd love to learn more about all these different kinds of caviar and be more knowledgeable myself. Yeah. Great, you know, I've tried some, but I feel like there's a lot to learn. And I think it's so inspirational how, you know, you got to caviar through, you know, unconventional channels, let's just say, but then made it a passion of your own, partnered with your sister who had the C CPA background, right? And then together you guys use your, you know, respective skills to build this business. And now you have your two retail locations, right? And 
you're educating people on caviar, you're bringing people together and it's, and you're letting people know how to make choices about this because, and make it more accessible. So I think that's just lovely. So, and congratulations on building your business and having your baby. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, we don't have any dull moments over here right now. <laughs> So we'll have to connect soon, but thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And before we go, for those folks that want to learn more about Caviar, how might they find out about, you know, Caviar Co and how might they order your product or find you? Yeah, so we ship, we ship all around the country. So our website is just the caviarco.com. And also our Instagram can be pretty educational from time to time where we really do some good facts and um, try to spread some information. So if you just follow us on Instagram at the caviar co, then, um, and then that's how you also learn about upcoming events and parties and um, dinners, special occasions, anything. All right, I can't, I'm waiting for my invite. <laughs> Perfect, well, keep July 18th open. I will say okay. that. It's All National right. Caviar Day, so it's, it's oh, a Oh, okay. Well, you know what? We'll do something. Send us some information, maybe what's new and next in caviar or something, okay. and we'll do something special to uh, talk about caviar with you. Well, that would be great. Thank you. All righty. Uh, so, so much information. So great to share your story. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Happy Monday. All righty. Thanks again. To learn more about these episodes and access show notes, go to nextgenpurpose.com and choose podcast. If you like this episode, head to Apple Podcasts or your favorite platform to subscribe and leave us a review. Visit the Next Gen Purpose YouTube channel to subscribe to our EI videocast and give this episode a like while you're there. Follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn at Next Gen Purpose and connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram at Justine underscore Reichman. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>